Now in its 10th year, this is GabNet. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey, everybody, live from Harlem in New York City. It's me. Yep, it's Alex with the Ramble. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go out to the west coast of the United States and say hello to our old friend Larry Bubbles Brown. How's it going, Alex? How's it going with you? I was just thinking. I went to my safety deposit box this week and uh, had some pretty now, interesting is baseball it, is, cards is, and it, stuff. And I'm thinking on, you on, must have a ton on. of memorabilia. Hold on a second. Is it safety deposit box or safe deposit box? Safe safe deposit box. Yeah. Every, I used to call it safety deposit box, too. Yeah. But anyway. And the, and the banks are getting rid of all of them. But Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so you went, you had baseball cards. There. I had some good baseball cards. I, got, I started to think, God, how much uh, memorabilia does Alex have? Cause you had a ton of stuff. I don't know that. What do you consider memorabilia? Oh, just little things from radio. Uh, people were always bringing you weird things in. And you know something? I think a lot of that's in storage if I saved a lot of it. It's not much, you know. I'm surprised. The the best, uh, I have a baseball card. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I have a Roy Hobbs. Roy Hobbs? <laughs> you don't remember Roy Hobbs? From The Natural. The Natural. I actually have a trading card for Roy Hobbs that was used in the movie. Oh, wow. Remember at one point in the movie, they're, they're, there's a printer, and they're printing out these Roy Hobbs uh, baseball yeah, cards? Yeah, uh-huh. Well, somebody cut them all up, and I got one of them. That could be worth a little money. I don't know, you know, I, because I've said to people, well, I have a Roy Hobbs, and they go, oh, that's nothing. That's not like, you know, they're like a Willie Mays or whatever, you know. What's the best uh, baseball card you've got? I've got a Mickey Mantle card, his last one that uh, I saw on eBay. Somebody had it for thirty-seven thousand. What? Yeah, it's. Uh, and I got I got have to get mine graded, but mine it looks like it's in really pristine condition. So that that's all the difference. So. Thirty-seven thousand dollars. Somebody had one, yeah. It's, uh, and I think it could go. I was reading. It, I think that card might go to a hundred. I don't know. Wow! Can I be? But your, for, can I be? His your rookie for, card is sold for. Uh, one of them sold for five million. Really? Yeah. That really is a sample of the old saying: "Don't throw anything out." Yeah. Oh. Wow! You so uh, can you be my friend with that kind of money? <laughs> You well, your old friend Shecky apparently had a ton of baseball cards. I think he did. You know, I don't know what happened to them. I don't know who got them. Uh, I don't know if they went out and found out what they were worth to find out what he was worth. You know, um, I guess you don't. They're not worth anything till you sell them. Right. Right. Now my question is: Okay, so now let's say it's worth fifty thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Do you want to get rid of it? Uh, no. Why? Uh, because I think it might be worth more someday, or I, maybe I, I kind of like to keep it in reserve in case I need emergency money, then I can sell it. Now, you know, those things also go down as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, I mean, there was a time when, uh, I, I'll tell you, the, the probably the one thing I've got here, I'm looking at it right now, it's in a frame, that I have is a postcard from John Lennon in which among other things he references all the trouble he got to in LA that one year when he like threw stuff in the pool and stuff like that you know I think he was hanging out with God who was he hanging out with somebody uh, Nils, Nilsson I think he, uh, 
he Nielsen was uh, like a real reprobate, and he got into oh, a really? lot. Of, he got into a lot of trouble. And it references it. It says, uh, "I hope I was okay. I had a lot of trouble in L.A. last year." You know. So it, and and at one point, it was estimated by somebody at being worth about twenty five thousand dollars. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know those things go down in value. You see, I mean, at that time, John Lennon had uh, had died, and uh, so it was really worth something. But as years go on, they 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 go down. And I asked Shecky how much he thought it was worth. He said about twenty five thousand. He said, but if you wait on it, it probably will either go up or it will go down. And I was led to believe it w actually would have gone down. And people say, well, but do you want to get rid of that? It's a piece of memorabilia. And I go, $25,000? It's yours. You know. Really? I, well, I mean, come on. Uh, yes, it's a memory. It's a keepsake. It's something that reminds me of something. But when I'm dead, it's not going to do me any good. You know, so why shouldn't it do me good right now? So I, I've never been one that says, oh, I collected this and now somebody wants uh, $10,000 for it. Hey, take it. It's yours. You know. So. But you don't, wouldn't give yours up, right? Not right now, no. I think uh, the thing like uh, John Lennon or Elvis Presley, uh, I think the Elvis people sold a bunch of stuff because they realized uh, you, younger people don't even know who Elvis is. That's so. right. That's right. So they don't see the price going up. Yeah. Well, Shecky, who was an inveterate collector, okay, uh, told me that, uh, in his opinion, uh, things are only worth what people are willing to pay for them. In other words, just because you've got that Mickey, uh, what is it, Mickey Mantle? Did you say Mickey Mantle? Mickey Mantle card uh, doesn't mean that it's going to go up. It could very well go down because mm -hmm. it all depends on what people are willing to pay for it. That's the market. So you don't establish a price on something because you establish a price. You establish a price only when it's sold and you found out what somebody was willing to pay for it. So, Welcome to the memorabilia show, folks. <laughs> you know, I mean... Uh, I'd probably do do better if I did a memorabilia show than if I'm doing this, but you know. Uh, but you know, it it uh, so that that's what memorabilia is worth, and it's only worth what people are willing to pay for it. That was according to Shecky, and he knew what he was talking about. And yeah, he, markets they they go up and down. Like baseball cards get real hot, then they'll cool off, and then something else comes up, it gets hot for a while. It's very trendy. And then if you wait a while, if it goes down, you wait a while, it goes up again. So, you yeah. know, but you're right about, about, uh, I mean, I mean, even true of John Lennon. I mean, how many kids know who John Lennon was? I, I know that right. sounds ridiculous when I say it here, folks, to all you old farts who are listening to this program. But the fact is the kids today don't know who John Lennon was. They don't care who John Lennon was. John Lennon was before their time. Right. Yeah. Was he as, uh, pop, as popular as Taylor Swift? Now that's a good question. Was he as popular as were the Beatles as popular as Taylor Swift? Hmm. Uh well they would both fill big arenas, but uh Yeah. Yeah. She would I wouldn't be surprised if she had more fans. It could be. It could very well be. Also, we didn't have the distribution of media in those days that we have now. I mean Basically, I mean, what did, what did they sell? They sold records. They sold mm -hmm. CDs. They sold sometimes the twelve inches or whatever. What was the size? Was the big size of discs? Um, twelve inch discs. So they sold them on discs. They didn't even have tape back then. Now everything's digital. Now, how easy is it for somebody to buy a Taylor Swift song? They simply go online, click a button, and next thing you know, they've got it in their machine. So they don't have to go to the music store and buy it. You want me to give you some? You want me to show you how old I am? Yeah. 
When I used to go listen to records, you know what I would do? I'd go to the record store. And do you know what the record stores all had? Listening booths. In wow. Other words, you could take a new record, you go into the listening booth, and you could listen to it to make sure you wanted it. That's how they sold it. They had, they had their, maybe in an average store, there were five or six listening booths. They were all little soundproof booths, and you'd go in there and listen to the music. Really? Yeah, you know, yeah, they don't exist anymore. I mean, the listening booths are your computer. You know. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was cool. You know, we, we went in there and spent hours dancing and doing stuff like that inside. Made the owners of the stores livid. You know. Come on, we well, need to use those booths to sell records. What? They were kind of social places, records. I remember Tower Records here. There'd be a bit, ton of people cruising around there. And mm-hmm. Do you, do you kind st- of fun. Do you still call them records? Yeah. If somebody plays you a song, do you say... <laughs> record. Do you refer to it as a record? I think so. It's not a record. It's a digital copy. It's not a record. God, I remember the little... Uh, remember the 45s? Oh, well, the 45s, of course. And uh, you had those little, if you, uh, you could play them on a, on a machine that did uh, 78s, 45s, and uh, 33 and a thirds. And the 33 and a thirds were LPs. Those okay. were like uh, comedy albums. Well, also they would have, uh, if you did the Beatles, they'd have like uh, six songs on one side and six songs on the other side. See, kids, if you're listening, you don't even understand what I'm talking about. And then the 45s were invented as a method of doing single records, basically. Yeah. And I thought they were very convenient because they had a big hole in the middle, which you could either put in a 45 player, which had a big spindle, or... I don't know if you remember this. You could go to the store and for like, you know, 10 cents, 20 cents, buy 10 little fillers that you could clip into the middle oh, of the it. the little plastic thing, yeah. Yeah, that would make it play on a uh, large turntable. Okay. Right. Uh, but the great thing about 45s were they had that big hole, and you could grab the 45 by the big hole with one finger and the edge of it by the other finger and never have to touch the surface of the recording. Did you know that was the reason for the big hole? I did not. Yeah. I mean, why else would they put a big hole in there? <laughs> you know, um, to make themselves obsolete, I suppose. But uh, 45s were a big method of selling a single, you know. And uh, then uh, all of a sudden, all those things went out of style because today it's all digital. I don't. Yeah, I just. Uh, I don't see how they actually made stamped a record out. That seems like an odd way to collect audio. So well, that's a big wax thing. Yeah. Well, they would record the song. Okay, you in the later years they would record it on tape. In the early years they would actually record it onto an acetate. Uh, they would uh, cut the record. Literally, you've heard the term "cut a record." What they would do is they would have it big thing that would record it would vibrate the needle and then they would put it down on the thing and you would start singing right don't stop finish your song when you finish your song they stop cutting the record all right then they would take that and they would move that over somewhere else and they would make an impression of it and which was a stamper to stamp out records so it would, would do that, then it would make this stamper, then the stamper would go into this machine, then they would take some vinyl and a little vinyl ball and put it in there and it would smush the whole thing down and make it into a recording. Does that wow. make does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So but they, then when, in they, when they said they cut a record, they literally did. They literally cut a record and I remember they used to have uh, little vacuum cleaners because as it cut, it, it left this residue which built up. 
So they had to kind of suck it out of there while they were making the recording so it didn't build up. And uh, uh, it, was, it was quite a process they had to go through. Um, and th once they got into the stamping part of it, and that was a mechanical thing and they could do, you know, hundreds an hour, thousands an hour, whatever. So that's the way they also did the 33s. They made a stamper um, and um, do you remember at the very end of every 33 there was a spiral yeah, yeah. so that the, the so the needle would just keep going back and forth back and forth back and forth I even remember the sound it made you know uh -huh. uh, but uh, so what, what it did is it was all, all had to be done in this spiral and you put it in at the very beginning and hopefully it started now in radio, do you remember? Do, did I ever play uh, like a thirty-three or uh, or a recording off a turntable while you were around me there at the? Radio I don't station? recall that. No. Because by that time we had put most of our music on uh, cassettes or on what some people called them eight tracks, but they really weren't. They looked eight like tra eight tracks. Yeah. They looked like eight tracks, but they weren't eight tracks because eight tracks had a spindle in them. These didn't. These you put in a machine. You click the button, it started, it played the music, and then it would go to the beginning of the recording. It was on like a uh, um, a, a loop that went in. I'm, I forget what we used to call it. It was a uh, it was an endless loop. Okay, so you started playing it, and it kept going back in, and then it stopped when it was through. And the reason it stopped is we put a tone on there, and that would stop it. You could actually put four different recordings on one tape and it would stop every time before the next one because we put it as you recorded it onto these uh, these uh, I don't want to call them eight tracks but onto these cassettes uh, as you recorded them they would each time you would start them they would create a tone and every time the machine hit that tone it would stop so does that explain it easily yeah, enough yeah. do you understand what I'm talking about so, but the thing is with recordings, see if you ever watched me play a recording, when I started out in the business, you had to queue up a record. Now what you did is you had a, a kind of like a, a cloth surface under the turntable, under the, you know, under the record. And you would put the record on and you would then uh, queue it up until it got to sound. And then you would take it and you would spin it backwards a little bit to get it before the sound started. So now it's ready to go, right? Well, the problem is you could just click the button and sometimes if you didn't do it just right, the music would start up by going like that, right? <laughs> so to prevent that, right, you, start, you held your hand on the recording, on the edge of the recording, started the turntable, because there was cloth on the bottom, the record wouldn't spin. And as soon as you wanted to play the record, you would let go of it. You don't remember those days, do you? No, that's old school. That's what I learned when I got into the business was how to cue up a <laughs> record. And Stacks it, of wax. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, later, the turntables got pretty fast starting up, and you could actually just flick a button and they would start. But you had to cue them up that way. You'd, you'd hear somebody going, mip, 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 and just getting the very beginning of the recording. So That's my history in radio, folks. I've gone from that to just pushing a button and playing a digital recording. So, uh, what has changed in your life that you used to do that doesn't happen anymore? <laughs> for the <laughs> well, since I hardly change anything, not a whole lot. Uh, well, how about microphones you've used? Those are still pretty much the same. Are they? When so. you first started, how many wired mics did you have? You used wired mics, right? We had wired mics, yeah. You used to almost have to like flick them to straighten them out while you were doing your act. Okay, I'm trying to think. When did I get the first wireless? So Probably when you did in. one of my shows. I think Cause, so, yeah. Because I bought uh, two wireless mics for my comedy shows. 
and they were really expensive. And I figured, why the hell should these guys have to walk around tethered to us to a, uh, uh, you know, to a mic cord? And so that's what we did. And uh, so I think it was probably one of my shows where you first met up with a, uh, a wireless microphone. That's right. I forgot. I, some guy I used to know, I worked at Harris once, and when singers were on stage, that there would be a guy behind the curtain, and he would always have to take up the slack and the microphone cord as these people were running around the stage. Right, right. I still, I got to tell you, though, uh, even up until a few years ago, if somebody said to me, do you want a wired mic or a wireless mic? I'd take the wired mic. I, still, I have a wired mic I'm talking into right now. And the reason is that um, wired never went bad. Right. They never go out. We would have wireless mics, for instance, when I was doing TV, and we would go out, and I'd have the wireless mic on. And the guy doing the audio would go, it's too much noise on the wireless. Let's do it wired. Let's hardwire it. Um, because there is a lot of static out there. Wireless can pick up static and is subject to all that kind of stuff. So wired, you never have a problem. I mean, hell, this microphone's been plugged in now for, what, a year now? <laughs> and it, I've never had a problem with the mic being Connected. And you can always you always had the chance of the batteries dying too in the wireless. Yeah, I, oh that too. You know, we used to carry around a whole bunch of batteries for our mics for those comedy shows, just in case they went out. And the reason we had two of them was in case one of them went out. You know, so that was the way to do it. You know, that's that's how it's changed for you. I mean, how many clubs do you go into that hand you a wireless mic now? Yeah, most of them. Yeah, most of them. So, that's, uh, you see, we've seen all that happen in our lifetime, right? I mean, and do you... Now, <laughs> now, in our twilight years, we wonder what becomes next. Well, you're about, what, you're how old now? Um, 72. 72. <laughs> so you're 12 years younger than I am. Uh, do, you, do you remember your first TV set? Of course. Right, there wasn't one in your house when you were born, right? Or was there? Uh, well, let's see. There. Hmm. So this is a, I've been mid in the mid fifties. I remember we had a TV, but. Oh, okay. Well, a lot of people started buying t TV sets in the mid fifties. I was born in 1939. I grew up on radio. Uh, okay. TV that was definitely before, out. yeah. Yeah, I remember when we got our first TV set. It was a, a, a TV set. It was a, a brand was Traveler. I, I know, uh, ridiculous, right? Traveler, and you didn't click the channels on the Traveler. It actually, you brought the picture in just by doing the knob. You know, channel seven was here, channel four was there, but you just tuned it in. Um, and I remember them coming and putting up a twenty foot antenna on the top of our house because we lived in Marin County and we're, we weren't really direct sight to the, uh, to the what do you call it, to the uh, uh, transmitters. So that was... Do you remember what, the, what a TV cost then? God, I don't know. I'd say... I think they were expensive. I think they were about $500 maybe. That's a lot of money then. Something like that. You know, um, yeah, that was a lot of money in those days. Uh, but then they got cheaper because they got mass produced. And that's when you had the boom. And in the uh, beginning of the, of the, um, the beginning of the 50s to mid 50s, television had a boom where they went from like, you know, several million sets in homes to like 50 million sets at home. So it just was this absolute boom. Uh, and it killed movie theaters. It killed a lot of stuff, you know? Yeah. My father was a musician. It, 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 it killed a lot of clubs where he would play music or outdoor venues, you know? So, I mean, people stayed home. They just watched television. They were mesmerized by it, <laughs> you know? And most of the television sucked. I mean, the stuff that was on was just pathetic. Yeah, so. Uh, I remember the first show that was on every day. 
when I first had TV set, went on 4.30 in the afternoon, and it was Howdy Doody. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And you would wait till 4.30 for them to turn the TV station on. It went to about midnight, and then you got a test pattern for the rest of that the That was night. it. <laughs> yeah. Remember the test pattern? Yeah. Okay, then you're old enough. Yeah, test pattern. The Indian mm-hmm. head in the middle of it. Anyway. I remember as a kid going into stores and uh, they had all these color TVs on display and the colors were so bad. <laughs> well, the next time I talk to you, I'll tell you how we read uh, Ted test patterns. <laughs> anyway, hey, we've run out of time here. We have. Another, another time just spent uh, talking about absolutely nothing, nothing. which is fine <laughs> with me. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Bubbles Brown. Yay! Now in its 10th year, this is GabNet. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey, thank you, Larry. We appreciate it. We appreciate your uh, joining us. And uh, as you do each and every week, and we really appreciate it. Uh, It's Friday night. Usually uh, Friday nights have been a really hot night for us, but I guess it's not going to be tonight because I only have one person waiting to come on here. Just one. Only one. And it happens to be Charlie Wallace. Um, let me see here. Let me let me see if we can... Uh, there we go. There's Charlie Wallace. Well, it's just you and I, Charlie. Wait a minute. He's connecting his audio. Mm-hmm. It's just you and I. Are you ready? Turn your... Uh, uh, he's connecting his audio, but it's not connecting. Oh, boy. See, it says there, Charlie Wallace is connecting to audio, and it's not uh, its not working. Hmm. Oh, there he is. So, Are you there? I had to shut off the YouTube button. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, 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 hello. Hi. Yeah? Well. Talk to her a little more directly into your microphone, because it's... Uh, I will try. It's kind of low. Oh, it is? Yeah, it's really low. If we can do anything to raise it up. It's just you and me, by the way. Yeah, actually, I've never had to change the volume before, so I don't know how to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, let me see here. Hold on a second. I think I can do something here. Let me see. Up, 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 up. Yep. Up. Is that good enough? Uh, I've, I've got it. I've turned it up here. Okay. There you go. Oh, well, here comes somebody else here. Oh, here comes Mark Thorner. Okay. And here comes Jeff Stein as well. Second night for Mark Thorner. And I love the fact that uh, Mark's with us because uh, one of my favorite callers of all time. So, okay. So here's something. Before I forget, Alex, and I wish I was on, I wish Larry was here. Yes, the thing about uh, the mantle card that he has it's only going to go up in value. Oh, really? Oh, boy. And here's now, here's the other story. Mm-hmm. In the 90s, Topps, the publisher of maker of baseball cards, had an auction mm-hmm. of their warehouse. And a bunch of us went more, more, more to score the auction catalog because it was a great book with all the stuff. One of the things was the original artwork for Mickey's rookie card it was a it was a illustration mm-hmm. that went for one hundred twenty five thousand no, dollars. Oh, jesus but now here's the here's the catch it was an anonymous you know we didn't know it was mickey himself because he had it on display at his restaurant on central park south wow yeah he, was, he, he bought it for himself just so we can put it on display wow but it was it that was one of the most insane auctions because when you realize the cultural history that Topps has in the nineties, in the er, in the like early nineties, they cleared out their warehouse, uncut proof sheets. I mean, Mars attacks cards, original artwork, all all of it went so high, it was unbelievable. It was a lot of fun. Don't get me wrong, but. Uh, but yeah, yeah, baseball cards like that, they only printed a finite amount and they're only gonna go up in price. 
so uh, so Bubbles shouldn't sell his, or Bubbles should sell his. I mean, because they can go down too, can't they? Very rarely. Really, I mean, the fact that I now you know they they still exist in some numbers, but boy, I mean. Uh, Yeah. And yes, I, I remember also dealing with vinyl albums in the school radio station. I think the system, wasn't it called Magna Cart? Um, the cart system. Jeez, uh, I don't know. There were several companies. Okay. The one I, I, but here's the thing, and I never got this right, was queuing up a record. Mm -hmm. And when it would end to hit the cart system to get the station promo. It, it took a lot of practice to go end to end, no gap. <laughs> yeah, like, well, well, I'll tell you what happened. Eventually, we started putting all the music on carts as well. Yeah. You yeah. know, and this the whole thing was cartridges. Yep. And today, it's just uh, uh, digital uh, systems with digital, uh, you know. I hear the system they refer to is called, it's the one that's serious, it's called Profit? Profit, yeah. What a system that is, because. But then again, when you think about how technology goes gone, yeah, you know, digital. I think it was profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, not P-R-O-F-I-T. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah, yeah, we used the profit system. That was it. And yeah, we... and it's funny because when I worked for the Warner Music Group, mm -hmm. and it's funny because vinyl still sells, it outsells because of the profit it makes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Next time you go someplace that sells albums, look how much they go for, the new ones. Yeah, LP is very expensive. I remember buying all mine for $3 or something. Right? Way back in the well, is it because they're having to be specially made now as opposed to when they were mass uh, you know, distributed. I, that might be part of it, but you still have stampers. You know, um, I just get a big kick out of seeing how much the White Album goes for now, and I'm like, no. <laughs> I look at it, I'm like, what's but the White nice. Album? What's the White Album going for? Yeah. I sold that a long time ago. Oh my God! I think the the this one it's like thirty eight bucks, and I'm like, even, oh, you even mean oh, you mean if you buy a new version you of now, the white yeah. album? Okay. And back in the day, even the half speed master stuff wasn't that much, but it was yeah. like, I look at it well, now. Well, let me ask you a question, since you seem to know something about this, okay? Uh, and by the way, folks, other people can call this program. You're allowed to. Anyway. Um, uh, the question I have is, have they solved the problem that, that these LPs, because they were vinyl and because they did have a needle in them, they would get scratches associated with them. They would start to degrade in that respect. I remember at the radio stations, we would have to change uh, LPs every now and then because the first track that you put on always had a little hiss to it because it was always the one that was queued up, you know? So what have they, have they done something to make these uh, vinyls a little more robust? You would think, seriously, as far as I know, I don't think, unless I'm wrong, it's still, a, it's still an album, you know? Yeah. That's why what I used to do, I don't know, um, Charlie, I don't know if you did this too, you would get your album yeah. and then you would make a dupe right to a cassette tape it's like yeah. what, you could preserve well, the album, you yes. know. And then I play the tape. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. That's why well, I've there got was... these albums I've had for 55 years that, that I can put on my turntable and play today if I wanted to. But, yeah, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, in the early days, there was no such thing as tape. Okay. Real to real. Back when I was buying my albums in the 60s. Oh, yeah, real, to real to real was tape. Real. But, 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 you know, there was a time when we just had LPs. That was it and 45s yeah and and 78s oddly enough still going but you know i don't understand see i would much rather have all my stuff digitized because i don't have to have you know like with these videos i have in back of me which you can't see because it's being covered by my green screen 
um, uh, the um, those things uh, I all put I put most of them on uh, on digital because it, why should I take up the room? You know, the, each time we went to when we went from forty fives to thirty threes, things got lighter. Okay, when we went from thirty three and a third to uh, well, we had forty fives as well, but they were heavy. Uh, but then we went to CDs, they became even less weight. And I think the cassettes were even less weight than a CD with the case. Yeah. So, I mean, each time we got to a place where you could store this stuff and not take up as much room and as much, uh, um, uh, and, and not as much expense either, you know. So I wonder why people now go, we got to have 33 and a third. Why, you want to get a hernia lifting 12 of them? <laughs> Tell know. me about it. I've moved these LPs so many times. <laughs> and I mean, that's my weight. Well, uh, and, and they, well they go, oh. you know, they say the, the sound is so much better. Well, I'll tell you, most of you people out there have so ruined your ears by playing music loud that you wouldn't know the difference between an LP and, and a digital recording. And in many, you know, in many respects, a digital recording is probably almost better. Yes, you don't have the dynamics. I understand that. Okay, they, they say with 33s, you have dynamics, better highs and lows and, you know, whatever. But I, you know, for, for my thinking, a music that takes up less room is what I want to have in my house, okay? Um, and uh, if the rest of you uh, want to, you know, go out and have those 33s and his, well, look at uh, look at uh, Charlie. Look at uh, just look at some of his. Th those yeah. are 33s, right? And I've got six times that in the living room. Mm -hmm. How many copies do you figure you have of albums? Uh, I think I've got over 700. I had something like 2,000 at one time. Yeah. Okay, because I used to get them for free. Record yeah. pool. Yeah. Yeah. I used to get them for free. And uh, they, they, you know, I, I, when I left San Francisco, I sold most of my music collection. I think I still have all my comedy records uh, still that I saved. But I got rid of most of the stuff because I wanted to move. I was coming out here. I wanted to be able to travel light, and I would rather have the money. Okay. What? It, 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 do you have any idea what album? I had things like Beatle albums. I had things like uh, Rolling Stones albums and so on. What album do you think I got the most money for? Any idea? You probably wouldn't even have a clue. Frank Sinatra? Well, I don't no, know. but here's the thing. No, you see, the thing, trouble is... Beatles albums weren't worth that much. And the reason they weren't is because why? Everybody in America had those Beatles albums. So they weren't rare. Uh, Rolling Stones, same problem. Um, the, um, uh, the Who, would uh, you could do better with The Who for some reason. Uh, they, I got more money for The Who. The top album that I got money for, I think, and this was years ago, I got $300 for the album, was the 13th Floor Elevators. I had a copy of the first album, their first album, as it was released originally in Houston, Texas, on a local label. Oh, okay. Okay. The 13th Floor Elevators. Now, can anybody tell me, you can probably, uh, Mark, uh, but uh, uh, it, can you, anybody else tell me here what the song was from the 13th Floor Elevators? I've never heard of them, so I don't know. <laughs> really? Well, You're going to miss me. Okay. And what they were famous for was having an electric jug. Wow. And I knew them in Houston, Texas. I helped produce that album, that song. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Yeah, I was in on with another guy um, who worked uh, for the record companies, and he, he 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 produced a thing, and I helped him do it, you know. So yeah, that that was. Uh, but and so I happen to have this album lying around, and the guy who I'm trying to sell stuff to is looking through it, and he goes, "The 13th floor elevators, you're gonna miss." And I'm going, "Yeah, really? How much?" 
Three hundred? I'll give you three hundred for it. Now, he's probably lowballing me for all I know. Yeah. You know, what do I know? I just wanted to get out of town. You know, so um, that was uh, that was uh, something. It was something. Um, but it was amazing what things would, were worth. Uh, well, you know what? I oddly enough, I couldn't get money for, and and this was strange. I have, and it's still in my, it's still in my storage in California. A copy of Tommy by the Who. Now you go, okay, Tommy by the Who. How many copies of that? One. Yeah, you got one, but you don't have the one I have. I bet not. What I have is a test pressing. Uh, a test pressing with a insert done on a mimeograph machine of all the songs that are on it because it was a white label. There was no, uh, you know, names of the songs on the label. And, um, it was a, a test pressing, and it said, Tommy, an opera. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of put a carrot in there and wrote in the word rock. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the guy couldn't tell, he, he, he didn't want to buy it from me because he said, I can't tell you what it's worth. He said, I've never seen anything like this in my life, and I have nothing to judge it against. So... I would have thought I could have gotten something for that test pressing. But. So if any of you want it, I'll, I'll will it to you, okay? <laughs> you know. Anyway, so. But, um, I've already got it, so. Yeah. I'm just in it for the music. Yeah, Shecky, <laughs> Shecky had a, a good baseball card collection. I never saw it, okay? But I was told by him that it was pretty good. You know, so I don't know what happened to that when he died. Whether they probably were, his probably his brother knows. Yeah. You know, but but uh, it, I don't think his brother was into that sort of thing. No, but but he probably got it. Whatever he did here. I think what happened was he left money to me. He left money to uh, this woman who was a. Uh, 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 yeah, what, the one actually found him. Yeah. The, the associate producer on the a, a director on the Letterman show was very close to him and she took care of him in his last year. Uh, and um, so then there was me and then there were a few other people who got a less amount. And then the money that was left over all went to Shecky's brother's wife's um, charity. She has mm -hmm. a charity or something like that. So I would imagine that probably the baseball cards were sold off and given yeah. to her, you know, the money given to her. Um, but I, I, I'm glad I didn't have to get rid of all. Uh, I, Randy, who is the woman who, who uh, uh, was the associate director over at uh, Letterman, she did all the selling of the stuff in the apartment, in the house, the selling of the house. Uh, I mean, she did all that grunt work and I went geez you know you got so much to clear out he had a, a baseball card collection he had a DVD collection which probably wasn't worth anything you know they're just DVDs most of them some of them were rare but very few very few um, you know for all the DVDs I have here I think they're worth about 35 cents you know um, because other people have them as well um, but he, uh, he, you know, he had a lot of, he was a collector. And so getting rid of all of that and being able to figure out what that was worth, you know, and how much it was worth to the estate. So that, that was the, uh, the problem. So anyway. Mm -hmm. But I thank Shecky, you know, for making my later years nice. Okay, thank you, Shecky. Um, but anyway, so, well, I guess this is all it's going to call tonight, but that's fine. Anybody been watching the news at all? Do you, uh, do you, are you finding the news interesting at all, Mark, on any level? Uh, no, <laughs> no more than anyone else, I guess. It's, uh, it's that perpetual watching of a car wreck, but, uh, yeah, you know, uh, What's like the, I, what's, I, the car, what's the car wreck? America? The whole situation with the uh, as I, as a friend of mine calls him the exploding Cheeto. Uh, 
Yeah. And all Trump all day. Yeah. Did you see? Did you see all these? Um, all these assholes in the Republican Party lining up to kiss Donald Trump's butt yesterday when he went to Washington, D.C., or as most of the people referred to it, returning to the scene of the crime? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, I mean, they're all kissing his ass. And, and you've got people like Mitch McConnell, who they've actually got video of him saying right after the attack on the, uh, on the Capitol, uh, 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 you know, Donald Trump should be held to account for this. It's terrible what he's done. I mean, he just vilified him. I think you remember it. And yesterday, uh, hi there. Let's shake hands. Okay, everything's fine. Every everything's forgotten. Uh, you know, it, it just it's amazing. It's amazing the short memory they <clears throat> seem to have. And I don't know what they think they're accomplishing for their party. I mean, they're literally. If, if he doesn't win this election, and I don't think he will. In the end, I think it's going to be close, but I don't think he's going to win. Uh, I think you've seen the end of the Republican Party as we know it. It's going to have to close down and regroup because this is insane. You know, they're just following, uh, why they're following him and why they're being so nice about it, I have no idea whatsoever. So, anyway, by the way, oh, there, there it is. There's my friend Don Giller. Ah, uh, there's. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. no, no, wait a minute. Is that real, Don? That's Don Giller. No, 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 yeah. no, no. That what he's holding is that. It is. That oh. on the side, that's Don Giller, the guy who just showed his face. Mm -hmm. No, no. If that's what I think it is, he's got one of the rarest of rares. Okay, I have is that. The, I have that one. This is a mono, not stereo. Stereo is worth more. I oh. have. I had that one. Okay, there's just one problem. What it was? Show them the other, uh, the other uh, mm -hmm. thing. Okay, if you went into the stores or if you got the album, okay, and you look closely, that butcher block cover was under that. That was. Well, that's how I got this. That was yeah. glued on to it. Okay, well, the thing was, I took it off, and it turns out it was worth more with it still yeah. on. Yeah, am I right? Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what happened was the first album. Put, put, put show them the other one. Th this one's an American version. I was supposedly the British version was much bloodier. There, there is no British version. There is no British version oh, of this, this. This was a capital invention. Oh, you know why? Of tracks that were that were on the British rubber sole and revolver, and they were uh, singles and B sides. Singles and tracks from the British version of Revolver, and uh, and Rubber Soul that were not on the Capital version. Yeah, but in any event, they they didn't like the cover. They thought it was morbid and terrible. I don't know what's so morbid about it. You know. And, they're supposed to be dead babies? Yeah, but, but, but they're doll heads. You know, they're baby yeah. dolls, right? They're not, it's not like they're dead babies. You well, know? It, it was their way of, it was the Beatles' decision to say, look, you're butchering our album, so we're going to make it literal. Yeah. That's what this is about. So anyway, um, uh, uh, they had that cover. Well, Capitol didn't like the cover, and they didn't want to do it. So what did they do? they put that other one on the front of it, glued it on, and that still remained underneath for, I guess, the initial run of that uh, of that album. Am I right about that? Yeah, Yeah. no, I, I bought this, uh, uh, in th this album was released in 66, and uh, I found this in Understock, in, a rec in I think, Corvettes uh, oh my in, God. in Baltimore, uh, and, and, and saw that that, that you know that that the original was was underneath. So did it. you remove that? Yeah. I How did you it. do it? I steamed it off. S steamed it off. Okay. Yeah. I tried steaming it off and I ruined the album. <laughs> I don't know what happened. But anyway, yeah, I I, uh, I got this the year later, '67. Now my that. question is, if you still had that glued on to that, would it be worth more than it is not glued on there? Uh. It it. I, if 
I couldn't do it. If if I had glued it back on, it would have, it would have screwed both. No, no, up. but I'm saying if you had never taken it off. Oh yeah, yeah, it would, it would it would be worth more. It would be worth more. Yeah. Because you could see underneath there was right. the other album cover. I I've, I've, I've so, seen eBay pictures of of this album claiming that that this is underneath, but you can tell it's not. You know, and they're selling for like 500 to $1000 and and they're ripoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, I don't. Were there any copies of of that album with the original cover that weren't covered up? I mean, did it make it out at all to be sold? I don't think so. Yeah, but I might be wrong. I don't think so. And yours is in mono, not stereo. Right. I say the stereo is worth more. So, what mm. do you think that's worth? Uh, a couple hundred, I would think. I would guess. A couple hundred. Eh. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Let me, I'll look it up. Yeah. But uh, you now, were you a collector as well? Yeah, I, I still have around two thousand, maybe three thousand records wow. packed away. Um, Josh, I, 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 no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, Mark, if you the thing is that if you don't know Don Geller. Oh, I know. I follow, and we're friends on social media. I oh, know, really? I know who Don is. Don's a legend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing about, Don? You are. All right, it's seven fifty for the stereo. I'm Se looking at eBay. Seven hundred and fifty. Yeah. No. <laughs> There's a. Hmm. State mono. <laughs> Guys, asking thirty-eight thousand. Uh, it hasn't sold yet. How could that happen? Well, you'd think if it didn't sell for thirty-eight thousand, you'd lower it to thirty-seven thousand, and yeah. then to thirty-six thousand, and eventually thirty-seven ninety-nine. How did he come up with that? <clears throat> Who knows? Yeah. I'm looking, there was a. Yes. Yeah, but Don yeah. Geller, in case people don't know, and he's been on this program well, several it. times. Stop it! Stop it! I just want to tell him what you do. <laughs> well, I don't want you to tell them. Okay, okay. He murders people for a living. I t I asked you not to tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, yeah, yeah. Oh well. You know what I watched? Which is kind of phenomenal. It has to do with some of the stuff you put up on uh, on YouTube. Um, um, Shecky years ago gave me a CD of every performance of Darlene Love on The Late Show doing Christmas Baby, Please Come Home. Right. It was so, a CD, just the audio? It, it, not CD, rather it was a DVD. And it, had, I, it was either one or two. It's somewhere around here, or uh, I still have it, uh, you know. Uh, huh. And, and you, you did a compilation of that as well. Yeah, I'm wondering which came first. How long ago did he do it? Do I don't know, know, but I think that he, you didn't get it from him. No, I, I made my own, and and so I'm curious whether he. This uh, is one he compiled, I think, himself from the stuff okay. he had at the Letterman show. Yeah. yeah. Uh, That's but uh, it, it, it was brilliant listening to mm -hmm. those arrangements that Paul Schaefer and, and the, did. The pitch would the, the the tonal pitch would go down because Darlene was having trouble hitting the high notes, which is common when you get that old. Oh, you know, really? I didn't notice so. that. They, so yeah. they changed the pitch on it. Yeah. She still could sing it like crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not a criticism. It's just well, a, what was amazing, I played it for Marjorie today. I said, Marjorie, I said, I want you to hear uh, Paul Schaefer, and I think it was a, it, 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 there was a song that uh, Phil Spector produced with Ike and Tina Turner. Yep called River Deep, no. Mountain High. I knew you were going to say yeah. that, yes. It R wasn't Ike and Tina Turner. Ike and Tina Turner did River Deep, Mountain High, I believe. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, uh, forgive me. I thought you were referring to Christmas Baby, Please Come Home. No, 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 no. Sorry. Uh, and, but it was the last record until the Beatles that Spectre ever produced. And the reason yeah, was... 67. The reason was when he finished that recording, he said, this is the best record I've ever made. And it flopped. And it flopped. 
Now today, you can't even imagine it being a flop. Everybody sings it, you know? I saw uh, a thing of, what's her name, the Canadian singer, uh, Titanic, uh, what's her name? Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Celine Dion. Celine Dion, doing it on the Letterman show. <laughs> B. Arthur. Yeah, on the Letterman yeah. show. And I said, I have a newfound respect for Celine Dion because she sang the hell out of that song. But the arrangement, and this is what I pointed out to Marjorie, I said, listen to this. Now let me play you the original arrangement. It was identical. Paul Schaefer managed to recreate that wall of sound in the studio. And it, he kept adding musicians and adding musicians, and it became a gigantic group of people doing it. But the fact of the matter was that um, as many people as he had doing it, I remember him doing it. And you, you had it. You posted it the first time she ever was on the uh, on the uh, NBC show singing yeah, "Christmas Baby, Please Come Home" with just basically the group, and it, he got it to sound like the original arrangement. <laughs> I mean, he, he was amazing. Uh, you, you remember the club in New York called The Bottom Line? Yes, of course. Sure. Mm -hmm. Of course. So there was a show called Leader of the Pack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she was she did it right. Paul and, Schaefer was in the... I'm yes. sorry. I'm, I'm here's stepping what, on your line. I'm sorry. What's interesting was that club, it was... To, when you when you heard it, it, it was like, holy shit, what did I just experience here? You know, and the place just erupted with a stand, you know, standing ovation. It was just phenomenal. That's why when he's <laughs> seeing it on Letterman again, it was like, yes. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, Ellie, Ellie Greenwich uh, yes. did that. Yeah. Um, and and Paul enticed Dave to go to see one of the shows. This was in 84. Uh, and Dave was so taken by Darlene's performance of Christmas Baby, Please Come Home that, that he, that, that eventually, that resulted in, in Darlene performing the song two years later on Late Night. How many years did she do it? Something like 27, 28? Well, she claims that she did it from 86 to, to uh, 2014 with no breaks. And that's just not true. There was a break, wasn't there, for a couple of there, years? There, she did it in 86. And then when the show went to CBS, uh, the first Christmas show in '93 was Andy Williams. Did 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 not that song, but uh, I think what a what a wonderful. Oh, I would Christmas. love to hear him try to do "Christmas Baby, yeah, Please Come either. Home." And then Darlene then began her <clears throat> run on Late Show from '94 until '06, and then there was a writer strike in '07, and then and then straight from '08 to '14. But she keeps on claiming that she did it from 86 to 14. Well, and one of the versions I saw, Dave said he, she's been doing it now for the last 25 years. Yeah, but that's that's just but not But was true. it just 25 years, but not continuous? It's like 18 years total. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but still, that's pretty amazing. And, and people get on my back for saying, no, Darlene said it was this one. I said, I just, I, I posted everyone. There are no others. If you can find them, you know, post it. You're not gonna find them because they don't exist. And occasionally she would. She had gone back to that show to do other songs, like she did. He's a rebel. She did. She uh, she, she did uh, River Deep Mountain High on late night ones. Yes, yeah, yeah. And and, and when Tina Turner, I think she did it better. I think she. Night. I think she did it better than Tina. Uh, okay. Is that heresy? Um, I don't. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um. When Tina was first on Late Night in 84, when she was promoting Private Dancer, which, which hadn't quite hit yet, mm -hmm. uh, during the commercial break, uh, Paul and the band played uh, River Deep Down Mountain High, um, which, which Tina acknowledged when, when the show went to her second, second guest segment. So that's mm -hmm. trivia that no one also should care about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, um... Uh, you know, I mean, it's just, a, but, I, but I listen to that, and I listen to what Paul did with that arrangement and with those arrangements, and I went, this is, this is ridiculous. You know, he, it's just, he, what a musical resource that man was for that show, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can't. You can't. Uh, uh, it it's a cliche, but he really is a musical encyclopedia. He just knows. Well, everything. also, also, if you think of all the people that on on late night shows were the orchestras, I can't think of anybody that was that valuable to a show. Yeah. And Paul Schaefer, you know, and yeah, he's a musical encyclopedia. You know, he could he could play an arrangement from any song. That's the funny part about it. And mm -hmm. of course, every song has a different arrangement. You know, so <laughs> whatever. Yeah. I I tried to come on last night, but uh, I couldn't get through. Well, we weren't on last <laughs> night. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We ran uh, a, a compilation last night of all my friends, uh, which didn't go over that well. So, <laughs> you know, nobody wants to listen to this anymore. I've got to, but what can I do to change the nature of this show? Stop Dance doing, girl. huh? What? Dancing girls. <laughs> Dancing girls. <laughs> what did he say? Charlie? Charlie? Dancing Girls. Dancing Girls. Oh, that'd be yeah. good. Uh, it'd be kind of tight here because this is, you know, this is a... That's a it green. doesn't have to be at your place. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Do you want them naked? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that sexist by today's standards? You wouldn't do naked women dancing today, would you? I know people would still go to see them. Yeah, yeah. Um... But uh, so, so you're you're uh, 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 Mark, you're you're quite familiar with the work of Mr. Giller then. Oh, geez, well, I have two very strange connections <laughs> to the Letterman show. I don't even know if I want to admit them right now. Would you steal? <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. Well, one has to do with uh, Calvert the Forest. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. who, who was my grandmother's neighbor and was a patient of my dad. My dad owned, operated a very successful optometric practice in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Do you know all those eyeglass frames that mm -hmm. Albert wore? They were from my dad's shop. Oh, okay. All righty. Second one. So you remember when Dave did those, that whole bit just bulb? the shops yes, in New York. Right, right. Well, one of the places they went to was a lingerie producer called Movie Star Lingerie. Mm -hmm. Do you have any movie stars here? No, we don't. But you're... Well, I think they interviewed my sister who's the design director. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my weird connections the, to... Yeah. 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 You know... Uh, well, I have a better connection to Conan O'Brien, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. Oh, well, I wouldn't admit to it, but you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, I um, um, and I was a fan of Dave's uh, AM, his morning show too. But that's a whole other. Were Were you a uh, 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 did you watch late night a lot? Oh a boy! Did you, oh boy! Hmm. I was going to show you. I'm going to tell you something. Oh, no, Marjorie, you're... Marjorie never watched David Letterman. And the reason she didn't is because she had to go to work the next day, and she didn't stay up that late. Okay, <laughs> um, so she she you know when I told her, hey, Letterman was the best there ever was, you know, and I've been through all of them. I was a big fan of Jack Parr. I thought he was the 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 mm -hmm. end all until let until Letterman came along, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, she started watching some of your videos and some of the Letterman videos that have been put up on. And then she has now become addicted to Dave, you know. And she had to admit, he's the best ever. You know, there's just nothing wrong there, you know. I mean, it slowed he's down he's towards Johnny Carson. What? He's, he's not better than Johnny Carson. Oh, yes. I think uh, so. No way. No way. I think so. So do you remember... Uh, what do you uh, know? I'm a professional. I mean, that's my opinion. I mean, even Dave would say he's not Johnny. Well, he would, but the fact was... Well, Mark, what would you say? Letterman or, or Carson? For me, it was Letterman. I'll tell you why. Johnny was always there. That was like my parents' generation. Mm -hmm. That's 
Dave was like the cool older brother or cool uncle, you know, the guy you'd hang around with and, you know, go to, go to a movie or a ball game with. And I, we, I just really dug where this guy was coming from. It was like, okay, he was a comedian. I remember see, I remember him in New York once and twice, but when he got that, <laughs> the daytime show, it was like, how does this happen? How is this going on there? And you just knew that. This well, it was, was because NBC made the biggest mistake they ever made. He was meant to be on in late night. That's yeah. the kind of act he had. And who thought he should go on at 10 o'clock in the morning is beyond me. You know? But it was just so bizarre to see this guy do this show. And it was like, am I watching another Ernie Kovacs in the making here? Mm -hmm. You know, and... And who was the announcer for Ernie Kovacs? Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly, yeah. Who was the announcer for the morning show for... Uh, for uh, Actually, there were two. There were two? Uh, uh, Bill Wendell was, came on when, when uh, 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 Hal Gurney became director. But before that, but well, now the, I can't the, think of his the, name. The, his name was Bob Sarlock. Bob Sarlock. And he was a San Francisco comedian. Right. He was there for the first six uh, six weeks, I think. Yeah. And, and then Wendell replaced him. Yeah. But they, 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 you know, it was it was a rough version of what Letterman became. What Letterman became at night was just so much looser and what appeared to be, even if it wasn't, off the cuff. But, you know, you know at that point in my life, I was working nights, then going to like CBGB's and then coming home, crashing and then turning the TV on and here's this and I'm like Letterman the comedian you know and <laughs> it, it, it was just like how does this happen next thing I know it I'm calling my friend Ed and we're talking you know we're both barely awake and we're watching and like running commentary going on I was a fan of coffee cup theater too yeah, yeah. how uh, long did that show last the morning show was it 12 18 weeks, weeks. 18 weeks and then Dave yeah. Dave figured that was the end of him and TV, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember uh, there was a guy it was on late night? He uh, he he um, impersonated uh, uh, Bob C. Wright and uh, um, and 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 the earlier uh, who was Mary Tyler Moore's husband? I can't. Think oh of yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 oh God. Yeah, I, I know. You, it, well, <laughs> but both were the head of NBC. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Grant, Grant, Grant Tinker. Grant, Grant Tinker. Tinker. Right. And there's a guy on the show who would come on and say, hi, I'm Grant Tinker, or hi, I'm, I'm Robert C. Wright. And, and he would present Dave with, with a Humanitas Award for, for telling just a god for joke. Remember that? Don't tell me you have it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Tell joke. joke. <laughs> and, and what they would do is uh, they would they would paste on other awards. What for people? It's for what? supper, supper, Hal. <laughs> that was a one night thing. You can see it where no, it begins I... and ends on the same day. How did you lay your hands on those? Um, an intern who worked for Conan. Uh, was given a tour of the prop room. This is in the in the mid nineties. After the they had guy, left, a after the, they had left, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, and the prop guy gave this to him, and he then sent this to me. That's how I got it. Wow. <laughs> okay. So. How much is that worth? <laughs> uh, Twenty. It's like bucks, Shecky something. once told me, things yeah. are only worth what people are willing to pay for them. Oh, sure. So that no matter, you know, it can be worth millions or it can be worth 10 cents, but it's only what is somebody willing to pay to lay their hands on it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you want to see more? Yeah, sure. But uh, uh, Tony, okay. while you're getting them, Tony. Yes. You know what? Funny you said that. I was listening to you before. I brought this over Shecky's house one time and, I, and he couldn't believe I had this. I went to the Comic-Con and I helped Jerry Robinson out and his helper at the table. He says, no way you got this. I says, at the end of the show, he says, come sit down. He signed a whole bunch of things for me for free. Mm -hmm. So I got them cgc I never sold them comic books. Then he says, wait, I want to give you something before you go. I says, are you sure, Jerry? He says, 
No, you've been a big help. He signed a Joker card for me. If you can see, I brought this to Shaq and show him. He could not believe you see it. Mm -hmm. And it's signed by Jerry Robinson. And I'm going to send this off to CGC to authenticate it. He signed it right in front of me. Now, even he told me that day, what do you think this is worth? I says, to tell you the truth, it's one of a kind. I don't think he would sign many because he was old at the time, Jerry. And this, actually, I couldn't even put a price on that. This could be worth anywhere from eight to $10,000 if somebody wants you to You know what it. I was told? If you have something and it's signed, yeah, and it's signed to you, it's not worth as much as if it's just signed. Yeah, he signed books to me, but this he just signed, he put his name yeah, on it. Yeah, but it's worth yeah. more without it being yes, signed is, to yes. you than, why is that though? Because I think it's more of a, because people probably frown upon it. Like if I see, like when he signed that he's, he says, I'm gonna just put my name on it for you. I didn't even say, you know, I couldn't believe he signed the Joker company because well, he was he was discussing the Joker at the Comic-Con. And hold, I was just like, wow. Yeah, hold on a second. I'm going to go get something here. I'll be right Okay. Back. I wanted to show you that because I showed that to Shecky. He, he could not believe it the day I brought it over that Saturday. He's like, oh, my God. I said, I know. I couldn't believe it. Hmm. I'm going to keep that, though. I would probably pass that down to somebody if somebody liked Batman Boy, or something. When I sit down for an hour, it takes me forever to get back up again. But when I showed that to him, he couldn't get over it. He said, oh, my God, that's Jerry Robinson. I said, I know. I couldn't believe it. Uh, here is something that is signed to me. Uh, the date on it is, there's a postmark on it. Oops. Kevin entered the waiting room. Okay, let's uh, let away. Kevin in here. Move. Hold on a second. Admit Kevin. Is it Kevin? Or is it going to wind up being somebody who isn't Kevin? Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, the date on this is 11th of March, 1975. Uh, I've shown this before. Can you see that? I'm trying to... I, I, there we go. Um, Tuesday. That was a Tuesday. It's John Lennon. <laughs> and uh, it is John Lennon. And oh, uh, the John Lennon thing. Yeah. You may notice he changed it to John Lennon O. That's nice, Alex. You got to keep that. Yeah. And uh, he uh, sent this Alex, to is me. That is, how much is the stamp? Does it, it says, say? it, uh, was it a dream or did someone hand me a phone telling me I was on the air with Alex Bennett? Jesus, <laughs> I hope I was okay. I had enough shit last year. That's when he was out that, in California. Is that the lost year, Alex? Was that yeah, the thing? that's lost the lost weekend. year. Yeah. Then it's got a signature down here. And then beside it, a little drawing of his face with the 75 written on it. See, if you can see oh, nice. that face and down on the bottom. Oh, yeah. There. Yeah. Wow. And he's promoting um, the rock and well, roll. I've never been able to figure out what this is worth. Shecky once told me he thought it was worth about 25 grand. I think it could be more. Alex. No, it could be worth be. less today because there are people who don't even know who John Lennon was. Oh, I don't know. No, 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 no. You're crazy. No. They, and it wasn't written. It was just a postcard oh, right. addressed to you. It wasn't yeah, written to, you know, it wasn't say for you, Alex, or best No, it says up Alex. here, dear Alex. Yeah, but it was written as a, as a letter. It wasn't written as yeah. a autograph best wishes. Oh, no, Alex no. This was, a, yeah. this was a letter. Right. Yeah. yeah so that's that's a little different. It's pretty cool. It but and it has, Alex, if, if it anybody has wants to buy it, twenty-five grand, okay? You know what you got to do. If you have a son, you know what you got to do. Do it. What I would say. To can, can you peel it off and see? Take if, it yeah, down to the. You take, house. you take that down to the auction house. Yes. They have one in the city. I, was, I knew a couple of people who worked in there, but they yeah. wanted that, but I, I won't give it to them. Yet. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how, how, how uh, much. Uh, that might be heritage. It's, it's all over. Not heritage, but there's another one out there. What's that one that they do the big auctions on all the time? South yeah, Sotheby's. Yeah. yeah, they might want something like that. You know, I I I have an autograph of all four doors. This oh, is you Morris? And uh, mm -hmm. and I and I sent a, an image to Sotheby's, and they weren't interested. Really? Yeah. Mm. Did you have it on a record then? I guess. Uh, it's a, a back of a play a back of a playbill when they were in Baltimore in '67. Hmm. And afterwards, I uh, they were, uh, I followed them to their car in an alley after the show was over. This was a, a concert where there were maybe ten people in the audience, um, and uh, and and I, I talked to Ray, uh, and, Jim, and Jim was was 
he was the driver, polite as hell, you know, completely different from his on-stage persona. Anyway, Sotheby's didn't care. They, they didn't really, they didn't give us Maybe uh, someone like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or something might want Yeah, something like let me that. see if yeah. I, I'll take that Well, it depends. it depends also Ooh. on some artists don't like signing autographs. So when they do right. have autographs by an artist, they're amazed. Like, this, yeah. this thing is not worth uh, money because of the autograph. It's worth money it's because, nice of, the, keep, because like of the it. content of the letter, of the postcard, yeah. uh, in which he's referencing problems he had, you know. Yeah, just because it's a postcard. It, yeah, yeah and it, it, uh, so it has a little more, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it uh, was, uh, you know, it, all of a sudden that just showed up one day, and I just kept the postcard because I kept the postcard. And then after a couple of years, I went, oh, well, I better go frame it. So I put it in this, you know. Yeah. Frame. I mean, just to think that he thought of you, it was yeah. on his mind. And then the I, then I, kind of I really used cool. to have it hanging up on my wall in my apartment. <laughs> and I went, you know, so many people come through this apartment. Yeah, I don't know if it would hang up. I don't house. think I should ha- hang it up anymore. So now I, ju- I just have it here in the office up on the on the thing. But I don't, you know, I don't have it somewhere where people can kind of grab it. And I'm going, well, maybe I should sell it because what's it worth to me? You know, I, I, I can't hang it to show it to people. Yeah. yeah, but now you've got a good 25, 30 people watching this. Yeah, who know to come up here and, and yeah. rob me? Put the me. up. Wait, sold to the <laughs> man. Put the only just on my checks out. Cash is king. Yeah. Well, <laughs> did you say you had more stuff? Oh, well, come oh, on. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is a, a Rubik's Cube. Oh, I got my Rubik's Cube, yeah. That, that NBC had know. promoted back in 82 uh, that Dave hated. He uh, did. <laughs> What, 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 what? It was actually used. Letterman as, cube. Yeah, it was actually used as a bumper. That's cool. And Dave said, "Don't ever, don't ever use that bumper again." Why? So that's, what, that's what this is. My cube. <laughs> no, no, Dave. Yeah, forget and yours. Who cares about yours? I solved this. I used to, I used to be able to. Do. Yeah, sorry. Oh no! Oh, no! Look at that. Look at no! Look at Good stuff. Uh, <laughs> right, Mark. Okay, it, it has instructions. What are the instructions? Read them to us. It's yeah. easy to play. Can have game night. It's easy to play. Just follow these simple steps. One, select an item. Two, guess whether or not item will float. Three, place item in water. Four, observe whether or not item floats. <laughs> Five, note whether or not your guess was correct. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Endless hours of fun. <laughs> Kill an hour. Wow. Are I even it, assign it, points. Is, it, it, <laughs> is that the only one they made up, or did they make up a whole bunch of them? Yeah, I, th- I think this is the only one. Really? Yeah. And there are the girls. There's the girl. And, and they, they posted uh, yeah, Play on the Roof. That, they, they added that on there. Play on the <laughs> Oh, yeah, the Rooftop Edition. There rooftop you go. Edition. <laughs> Okay, uh, and and those are the uh, will it float girls, including Grinder Girl, who was my favorite. Uh, <laughs> the girl, uh, yeah, yeah Grinder Girl. There's, uh, yeah, there's, where's Grinder Girl? She's uh, she's there. There, there she we is. go. What she had was a medal. She did this out at uh, Coney Island, and she mm-hmm. had a uh, what it is basically is a metal corset, and she had a grinder, and then she would put the grinder against the metal corset. And sparks would go flying, and she was part of the presentation of Will It Float. So, you know, wow. Well, um, now you're going to be arrested from stealing stuff from the Letterman show. Yeah, this is this, this was given to me. It was given to you. Oh, yeah. okay. By somebody there who appreciated you. <clears throat> Pat Farmer. Yes. Of course. He gave it to me. Hmm. Wow, I wonder. Yeah, I often wonder how much stuff goes missing from those shows after they close down. Oh, you know? uh, yeah, because you walk out the door, you want to take stuff with you. I mean, I'd like to know what did Dave take with him. Does anybody me, know? Me, Dave me, must have taken something that meant something to him. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. But I, 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 I'm pissed. I can't find the doors thing. I know it's around here. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't, you didn't take a big ass ham with him back to. Uh... <laughs> yeah, if you got a big, I, you, you aren't that good, so far as I'm concerned, because he's right. You don't have a big ass ham. <laughs> if people I know don't someone know who does, if people don't uh, know what I, we're I, talking, I, what? I think Jason Zinnemann got got one, and and he he saved it for years, and of course it reeked. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did he open it up? I think he did. <laughs> I wouldn't open it up, you know. But a big ass ham. Yeah, people who never watched Letterman don't know what we're talking about. Don't see the value in the will it float home game, you know. Uh, but uh, you remember this stuff, don't you, Kevin? Yeah. Yep. 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 See. Ah, uh, boy. Now, this, is good show and, this is a good show and tell show. Stupid people tricks, all that stuff, yeah. Um, next, next time, I'll, I'll, I'll dig out the doors thing uh, and, and show it next time. Yeah, yeah well, I, if I had time, I'd bring in the, I have a whole poster of the Tommy by the Who. I heard you had to wreck it. That's Elmore, nice. signed on the back a card oh. from uh, Peter Townsend and oh, wow, uh, his, the nice. management team at... Uh, Kit Lambert, Kit Lambert, and I can't remember the other guy's name. And uh -huh. uh, they signed it. And it's also signed by the guy who did the artwork. But it, it, over the years, his signature, because it was done in ballpoint, oh, has kind of, you can barely read it anymore. Uh, in 67, uh, 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 Mick Jagger and Keith Richards were busted, and they were put in jail. And, and The Who released a single only in England uh, the A side was the last time, and the B side was under my thumb. Right, right, yeah. And uh, and I have it, which of course it's somewhere. <laughs> well, I'll tell you though, uh, it uh, you know this is this is fun stuff. This is fun stuff. I uh, I yeah. I'm I over the years I collected a lot of stuff, but I got rid of it, you know, just because I. How much can you collect? You know, it's like in life, you start out, you know, with nothing, mm -hmm. and then yeah. like a snowball rolling down a hill, eventually you become this giant snowball, and then you become an avalanche, and you're yeah, dragging this stuff wherever you move. The great story I have, and I'll tell it to you quickly, I did a TV show down in Houston, Texas. And when I stopped doing it, I said to them, uh, do we have a copy of the show? And they said, yeah, here. And it was like one of those, you know, huge two-inch yeah. tapes that weighed about, I don't know, 15, 20 pounds and came in a case. Did right? you with you? So it's I took it everywhere for the rest, for the for the years that came. I took, went, took it to, uh, 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 let's see here, I took it to Minneapolis, I took it to New York, and then I took it back out to San Francisco. And okay, while you can never play it. Well, I did. Because when I was at Channel 44 in San Francisco, I had this uh, uh, this tape with me, and they had some old two-inch machines. Mm -hmm. So I said, here, could you make a copy of this for me? Yeah, we'll put it on. And they put it onto a VHS for me. I've been lugging this thing around for years. I put the tape on. It's somebody else's show. Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh <Aldo>. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, hey, I'm playing the theme. Uh, boy, this has been fun. This has been really yeah. fun tonight. It's been a joy. Like the I'm glad to have Mark back. I mean, it means he's out of work, but you know, what the oh. hell, Mark? I, you know, I feel sorry for you, and if there's any way I can help you, I will, but please, you know, call us. You're wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll probably be around Monday, so. Uh, I'm not. Oh, Monday, the Monday show. Oh, Monday yeah. Show, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're welcome on that one. So's Giller. Giller, come on to the Monday show, okay? Uh, I usually take naps around that hour. Oh, jeez. <laughs> cool. cool. I take naps at all hours of the day. Just turn the TV set on. I'm out. Watch your yeah. baby. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, Charlie, for being here tonight. And thank you uh, 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 for being here tonight, Mark. And uh, Jeff? Thank you. We appreciate it. It was very interesting to listen y to. Yes, this. Don Don Giller. Yes, a very <laughs> visual show today too. Uh, Tony, thank you, and thanks to Kevin. All of you, give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you. Okay, there they go. That's our citizen panel, folks. I'll uh, 
sign off and get rid of them. And uh, they'll probably be back again next time. Hey, listen, uh, uh, Amy Manuel is next with The Intersection. She'll be here at GabNet Live on Skype. We'll see you again on Monday. We're on uh, Facebook. We'll be doing the, uh, uh, the uh, Monday show at 4 o'clock. And then we'll be back here again on Wednesday. Same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her. Okay, good night. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye. <laughs>